Well, the UCI have announced that they're going to have significant changes to their rules in 2023. And what this has basically triggered is a lot of speculation about what should be changed and what they are going to change. And I thought that was quite interesting. And I would like to put forward some of the things I would like to see changed. And you can put forward what you would like to see changed down in the comments. So let's roll that intro and let's get into this hypothetical speculation of what we think the UCI should be doing. Now, the first thing that a lot of people like to talk about is the weight. Now, the weight is something that is a bit difficult because if you lower it, then are we going to allow the frames to become a little bit more fragile? Manufacturers are going to be pushing these limits too far. But that has not really been shown with the adoption of disc brakes. The bikes have actually got a little bit heavier. But uh, what I reckon they should do, instead of having a weight limit, they should have a structural limit. So what they do is, is the frames and wheels have to go through a specific UCI test, and that can be contracted out to a third party. And that type or that design needs to be put through a certain stress test. So those wheels can be shown that they're fit for purpose and they're not gonna break or collapse when the riders are riding them. So they're not leaving up to the manufacturers to make a super light frame that they feel is strong enough to be raced on by a 50 kilo guy. The, the test could be set so it encompasses all of the different rates and size of the riders and power that they put out. So therefore, the bikes don't have a weight limit as such, they have a structural integrity limit. And I think that would be the best way to go and let the manufacturers make the bikes however they want. Now, the second major thing that I've always had a real issue with and I found is very, very strange when I watch this pro cycling because no other sport really does it. And that is where they have all of this entourage following them around. They have motorbikes following them around and they have cars following them around with spare bikes and spare wheels. And then they have people that have generic wheels they can fit on all the bikes. And what this does as far as I'm concerned, it takes away the ability of the piece of equipment to be made so it's capable of traveling the distance. Now, if you look at Formula One, the cars have to be designed to make the, the, the distance. And if they have any problems, they have to actually get round in that whole lap back to the pits to do any work on the car. They can't just send out a car that follows them around and go and fix it on the go. If they break down out in the field, races over and i think this there should be more what do you call it responsibility on the piece of equipment to get the rider from the start of the race to the finish of the race and this was also bring the reality of tires and equipment back to the user which is like us you know it's, yeah you can you can ride these special tires and are super duper fragile and light because they can just swap the wheels and get a new wheel any time but how about making a wheel that if you get a flat, that's going to affect your race and you need to somehow change it. The rider has to change that tyre themselves or they have to have some system like a seal and pressurised system to get their bike go again. And what they could have is stations along the stages where those they need to get to those stages before then they can actually get a new piece of equipment so they can change out their wheel or whatever. And this would probably make the development of tyres and these inserts and everything a lot better because most people probably don't really care about them but if they were part of the race at a pro level it would make those components a lot more attractive to everyone and they'll be able to see how they perform at that level because if they get a flat and then they make it to the next station they change the wheel then that particular puncture protection device has aided in them staying in the race. And the other thing that this was also stop is where they have these cars and they have riders going back to the cars and they're getting bottles and they're getting food and then they're going back up and then they're being motor paced back onto the peloton and we've seen this where bikes are basically touching the back of the car and they've got tire marks on the bumpers of the cars and they've got mechanics hanging out of their cars fixing the bikes as they're riding along and they're chatting to the drivers and all this sort of stuff. All that sort of carry-on would be stopped. And we'd also, 
I would also make a rule where motorbikes and people filming need to stay a certain distance away from the riders because we've seen in the past where riders have taken advantage of partially drafting or going on the motorbike to get some advantage or put off a rider behind them and potentially causing an accident or has caused an accident. And I think that all of these artificial people that involved with the race should not be in close proximity to the peloton. You may have a generic safety car that travels behind the peloton and that's for safety reasons. So if someone's hurt, you can get emergency services to it or that person can be taken on the ambulance very quickly. And the motorbikes need to be kept out of away from it. We've got drones, we've got all sorts of other technology to get cameras. And one thing that was suggested also by Cycling Tips is all of the bikes must carry some sort of transmitter camera on their bikes or they need to carry something that's equivalent to the weight of. So then it doesn't penalise any cyclist. So we're getting the footage from the riders, we're getting footage of them riding the bikes and that would be really good for us people who are viewing the race but we're not penalising anyone for running that equipment because everyone has to either add that weight to their bike as a dummy camera or they have to run the camera with all the full connection so it can be a transmitter as well. Now I would like to have fuel stops. Now these fuel stops could be over quite a long distance of say a kilometre so there's no congestion when they come into the fuel stops. So you could have different teams at say two or three hundred metres apart or they could have generic ones where they pick up water and food but I would like to keep them apart so there's no, we have no problems with people crashing and slowing down. They peel off, they go to their little tent and these tents could be at a minimum distance of say 10 k's apart and they're the only places they can get food and drink. They can't, they can't get them and go back to a car at the back and whatever. So they need to plan their races a bit more and at those stops they can do significant things like they can work on the bikes, they have all the parts or we may even allow them to change the bikes. Although I'm not a big fan of doing that I would like to see that the frames at least have to the frame that starts the race needs to finish the race we can't just swap our bikes and therefore that puts a lot of emphasis on the equipment being fit for purpose to finish the race because at the moment we the customers buy products and we go oh yeah the pros have used them and they've been proven but they've been proven in an artificial environment, an environment where if something breaks, they've just got a team car, they can just change it. So the reliability or serviceability of that product really doesn't need to be that good because it doesn't it doesn't really have to last the full length of the race because if it breaks, they can just change it. But if they had to rely on that piece of equipment to finish the race, like their tyres and their gears and everything like that, and their derailers and their systems, I mean, in any other type of race, especially a motorsport race, if something breaks in the car, that's your race is over. It's not, it's not like you can just give them another car. It's not allowed. It's just, it's just not. And the only, thing, the only time I see that that's actually relaxed is if it's a team car. I know in the Formula One at some stage, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to allow them to swap the cars. Like if one car broke down, they could swap it with their teammate. And I think possibly that should be allowed, but... Apart from just giving them a new bike, no. They, the team has to make some sacrifice if they want to do that. And that's my thoughts on it. I think there should be a lot more focus on the equipment and how the equipment works and how the equipment helps the rider get across the line. The, the equipment is part of the race. where It's not like a running race where it's just you with a, a cycling event. It's the bicycle and the rider and the bicycle needs to be fit for purpose to get that rider from the start to the finish without having to have this trail of cars and, bikes, and motorbikes that follow them along to make sure if something breaks. Now, I know there's the argument of, yeah, but then it's not fair to the rider, but you've got to understand this is cycling. It's a rider-bicycle combination. The bicycle is part of the instrument of getting the rider to the end from the start to the finish and the bicycle should be able to do that it should be reliable and the tires and wheels and everything like that should be capable of getting you from the start to the finish and if you crash out you crash out <laughs> that's that's the way it is in any other sport you know 
Yes. Especially in motorsport, if you crash out, you crash out. They don't just come along and give you a new car and off you go again. And they go, oh, it's about the driver, it's not about the car. It is about the equipment, and the equipment needs to be fit for purpose. And that's my view on it. Now, with some of the other rules, which I call the auxiliary type rules, they have things like throwing, you know, a bit on, and also these handlebars that the that they're kind of being very strict on at the moment. Now, I do agree that the bike needs to be used as it's designed, so you shouldn't be sitting on the top tube. I do believe if the manufacturer's designed a seat and a handlebar, that those are the points you're supposed to be touching, near the points you should be using. You shouldn't be sitting on the top tube. But I do believe that the handlebars should be allowed to be designed to allow the riders to get in a more aero position. Now, people might go, oh yeah, well, TT bikes are dangerous. Well, let's not have full TT bars, but what we could do is, is allow the handlebars to allow them to rest it on, but have the handlebars designed to do that and relax the rules a bit. Because I think that if the guys can get into a more aero position, it aids them if they have breakaways and we can have more exciting racing. And remember, these are the best riders in the world. They should be able to handle a bike and they should be able to handle a TT bike and they should be able to handle a bike that's got a narrower handlebar set. They riding these bikes like virtually daily, they train on them. They do thousands and tens of thousands of kilometers on them and they should be able to ride them proficiently. And it's not like just you and me who go, oh, it's now a handlebar and we can't handle a bike properly. These are pros and they're getting paid a lot of money to to do what they do. And I think that they should relax. I don't I think the frame designs and the the rules around limiting the aerodynamics of the bikes should be relaxed significantly. Now, I don't agree with having a full TT bike, but the road bikes should still have drop bars and so forth. But the the way that they've limiting the frames at the moment, which basically stopped them from making full aero bikes, I think should be relaxed significantly. So probably go to some of these bikes that we're seeing that they use in the in the TT or triathlon market, but they have to have drop handlebars and obviously some basic road cycling rules because they're in close proximity to other riders, but allow the frames and the handlebars to be made a little bit so they can get more into an aero position, but it's not going to compromise or, or significantly compromise the handling of the bike. Now, one rule that is always seems to be broken, as far as I can see, I haven't really researched it that much, but it does seem to me that this rule seems to be ignored considerably, and that's new components in the pro peloton. And we see, we've seen it before. We know that riders do use specific continental tyres you can't buy, and that's kind of been going on for years. And we know that SRAM used their ETAP a lot longer than... I think the 12 months that they're allowed to use it before they release it. And these products really just break the rules and there kinds to be very little consequence to the manufacturer. So they just keep doing it. It's no biggie. But I think the consequences should be significant or they should limit the use of them until they're actually released. So they can only be used, say, in 20% of races. You can't use them in all the races. Or if they breach the rule, then they aren't allowed to use their products or their subsidiary products for a three-month period on any of their bikes. Something pretty harsh because, you know, to me, the equipment is supposed to be able to be bought by the average person like me and you out there. And they're really conning this in this market. And are they really the same products that really come out on the market? And I think the UCI needs to clamp down on this. They need to use what we can buy and if it's not available, then it needs to be limited. Or if they break that rule, there needs to be significant consequences to doing that. So they so they've kept. Or if they if they can't meet their release date, then they have to limit the. They can't keep using it. They have to limit the use of it. And I think that um, they should make it that once you start using in the peloton, you have you have to give a release date. You have to have a release date. And if that release date can't be maintained then they have to pay some small fee or they can't get the equipment then becomes void. It can't be used. So there has to be, I mean, there's many ways we can penalize the manufacturers, but I do think that the manufacturers need to be more involved in the 
reliability and performance of their products and they also need to be penalized as well if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and that doesn't seem to be happening at the moment the the rules tend to be relaxed or not relaxed however the UCI feels and then when we talk about things like what the guys are doing like the the, the bid off when they throw it I think the rule should state if it endangers other riders not like you're just not allowed to do it because it's it's such a tradition in pro cycling and what they should say is that if you throw it and there's other riders behind you or you haven't pulled to the side potentially endangering other cyclers then there should be a board and then you have a penalty time if that board decrees that they felt that that was endangering other cyclists but they need to be a lot more consistent with their rules that's for sure because we all know the UCI applies rules hit and miss and they read the they read their own rules however they like and I think that needs to be tightened up because it really makes it quite unfair you know if someone's if someone's penalized like for taking some water near the end of a race and he's not penalized but someone else does it and they're penalized then you could argue you go hang on a sec you know is there some sort of favoritism here or something or you know are you just like just hopeless at applying the rules so in conclusion i think that there's so much investment in cycling these days and the team spend a hell of a lot of money there's a hell of a lot of training the uci really needs to lift its game number one it needs to apply the rules a lot more consistently and the I've read some of the UCI rules and, and I used to write rules for my company, right? I used to write practices that people need to follow. And from me reading those UCI rules, they're very vague. Whoever writes them is just kind of writing them down very quick. They're not, they have not got any detail or really explain to riders what they can and can't do. And if they're a bit ambiguous, then riders do things that they think are okay. But And then all of a sudden the UCI comes, oh, you can't do that. And they go, well, where does it say that? And they go, well, we've decided it says that. That's the first thing. They The, the rules need to be written a hell of a lot better. Two, I do believe that uh, this whole following the peloton thing needs to be disbanded. The bicycles need to be capable of getting the rider from point A to point B, and that includes tyres, punches, mechanicals, whatever you want to call them. Those things, if they break down, then that has to impact the the ability of that rider to finish the race, like in most other sports where there's some sort of vehicle device that's used. And if you can't make it or get to the next checkpoint, or or as normally with cars, it's a lap, if you can't get the next checkpoint and you can't get that fixed, then your race is over. Goodbye, bad luck. Now the third thing that I do agree that I think that they should do is relax the aerodynamic rules and that is that the bikes are allowed to be a lot more aerodynamic more like the non UCI bikes they use in triathlon but of course we want to still see the normal handlebars and road bikes. So we can identify with a road bike, but allow them to narrow the handlebars, allow them to ride on those bikes or, or design them so they can safely ride with them with their forearms along the, the handlebars and, and the supporters so the bike can be controlled properly. Allow them to do that. And the next one is the weight limit. I think that the weight limit should be disbanded. Generally, the bikes are heavier than the weight limit anyway because they're riding disc brakes. And I think what they should move to is in stuck in, in st <laughs> structural integrity, where what they do is they test the main things that can be failed, which is the wheels and the frame, and they have to meet a significant structure. Now they could make they could make that structural testing quite significant. They could say it has to be this thick, it has to be this. So then the frames are they can't be made like ridiculously light. They have to be made so they're strong. So the structural integrity of the frame is good enough to take, you know, even a hundred hundred kilogram rider or any rider. And then the wheels need to be made. They can't make them super duper light with like hardly any spokes on them. And they can even say how many spokes they want to have on them and they can do some strength just to make sure that they're not gonna not gonna collapse. And then that would kind of set the weight because they can't make them any lighter. Anyway, guys, you tell me what you really is your bugbear with the UCI and what you would expect them to change with an update. And leave your comments down below so we can share that. 
and also remember to smash 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 that like button because it helps push the information out into the internet so more people can share the videos and also we can make the community bigger so we can share our information of what we do on our bikes and also subscribe down below so you don't miss any more content in the future that's where i'm going to leave it guys and thanks for watching cheers